All right, this is the second part of section 4.2. This is the addition rule. We just went through the multiplication rule when we're asked to find, hey, what's the probability that this happens and something else happens next and something else? When we're doing an and problem, we're multiplying. We're going to see here when we have an or problem, we're going to add, use the addition rule. Okay. This section presents the addition rule as a device for finding probabilities that can be expressed as the probability of A or B, the probability that either event e, either event A occurs or B occurs, or perhaps they both occur at the same time as a single outcome. Key word in this section is or. So one of the first things you need to do when we get into this as far as an exam, you got to read the problem and say to yourself, hey, is this an and or an or problem? If it's an and, sometimes the word and will be there, but most times it's just implied. When it's an or problem, they'll be specific. They'll say the word or. If it's and, you know that you're multiplying. If it's an or problem, you're going to be adding. So that's the first thing you need to get squared away. In this section, the key word is or, which is the inclusive or, which means either one or the other or both. When we had the uh, multiplication rule, we had to think about, you know, do I have to adjust the probability of the second and third event? Were they dependent or independent with the or problems we, we're going to find out that we have to worry about are these events mutually exclusive which means they cannot happen at the same time another word another adjective is the word disjoint when things cannot happen at the same time or there's no overlap compound event the uh, addition rule um, any event combining two or more simple events the notation is probability of A or B, probability that in, in a single trial, single trial, mind you, either event A occurs or event B occurs, or perhaps they both occur at the same time. When find the probability that event A occurs or B occurs, find the total number of ways that A can occur and the total number of ways that B can occur, but find that, to that total in such a way that no outcome is counted more than once. No double counting, I call it. There's the formal rule, all right? Probability of A or B occurring is a probability of A added with the probability of B minus the probability of both. Now, sometimes things cannot happen at the same time, so there is no subtraction necessary. All right, we'll see how this works out. We say that events A and B are mutually exclusive. In other words, disjoint if they cannot occur at the same time. I can't be on a plane going to, uh, going to Chicago and be on a uh, boat going to Brazil at the same time. All right? Mutually exclusive events, disjoint. This means that A and B have no common outcomes. So put another way, probability of A and B happening at the same time is, is zero. All right, mutually exclusive, sometimes referred to as disjoint. All right, the, um, if events are indeed mutually exclusive, if they can happen at the same time, notice you're not doing any subtracting. You're just taking the probability that A occurs and you're adding the probability of B occurs. There's no worry about subtracting any double count because there is no double count. They're mutually exclusive events. They can't happen at the same time. Venn diagrams, probably been seeing this since maybe about the fifth grade. All right, this is an example right here of events that are mutually exclusive. There's no common event. There's no overlap. And obviously here you see the portion here where there is an overlap. These guys are not mutually exclusive. They're not disjoint. Probability of A and probability of the complement of A, well, they can't happen at the same time. It's impossible for an event and its complement to occur at the same time. Pretty obvious. Once you decide that you have to find a probability of an or combination rather than an and combination, what formula do you use? Well, it depends on the situation. In particular, it depends on whether or not the events being combined share any common outcomes. Take a look at this. Um, Number five, you randomly select a physician at Bellevue Hospital and you get a, a surgeon. You randomly select a physician at Bellevue and you get a female. Well, obviously, a surgeon could be a female. There's going to be some overlap. These events are disjoint. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I take that, that back. They're not disjoint, right? You can't have a woman and a surgeon at the same time. Number six, conducting a Pew Research poll and randomly selecting a Republican, doing that same poll and get a Democrat. Well, those would be disjoint. No one's going to be 
consider themselves a Republican and a Democrat at the same time. You randomly select a Corvette from the Chevrolet assembly line and get one that is free from defects. You randomly select a Corvette from the Chevrolet assembly line, you get one with that dead battery. That can't happen at the same time. If it's free of defects, then how can it have a dead battery? Because a dead battery is a defect. These would be disjoint. You get a fruit fly with red eyes, and you get a fruit fly with dark brown eyes. Well, apparently what we're saying is that a fruit fly can't have red eyes and brown eyes at the same time. Disjoint. Receiving a phone call from a volunteer, number nine, um, of a, a survey subject who believes there's solid evidence for global warming. Receiving a phone call from a volunteer survey who's opposed to stem cell research. Well, it could be some overlap there. It could have a person who believes in global warming and is also opposed to stem cell research. All right. There is an overlap. These are not disjoint. Randomly selecting someone, number 10, who's treated with a cholesterol reducing drug Lipitor. Randomly selecting someone in a control group that takes no medication. Well, how can you take Lip Lipitor and be somebody that takes no medication? Lipitor is a medication. All right. So these guys here uh, would definitely, definitely over have some overlap. This used to change here. This number 11 is different. Random selecting a movie with an R rating. Random selecting a movie with four stars. Well, they definitely could be overlap here. Definitely could have a R rated movie that also has four stars. 12 is sad. Reason being, this wasn't always the case. You randomly select a college graduate. You randomly select someone who was homeless. Well, back in the day, if you had a college education, Chances are very slim that you would be homeless. But now, not the case. There, There is overlap here. You'll find people who are college graduates who are falling, 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 hard times are falling upon them, and they're homeless. So the, these guys would not be disjoint. There would be some people who are homeless who are having to be college gra graduates. It's a sad state of affairs in this country that you would have something like that happening. So anyways. All right, consider an introductory stats class with 31 students. The students range from freshmen to seniors. Some students are male, some are female. Um, this figure shows a diagram. Here are your freshmen. It looks like you've got uh, nine um, females and six males, total of 15. Here are your sophomores. Here are your juniors. Here are your seniors. And many times, the data is presented in tables just like this one. Suppose we select one student at random from a class, find a probability that the student is either a freshman or a sophomore. All right, so I see the word or, so I know I'm going to be doing addition. So no matter what happens, I know I'm adding, I'm not multiplying. All right, since there are 15 freshmen out of 31 students, probably you pick a freshman is 15 out of 31. Since there are eight sophomores out of 31, probability of getting a sophomore is eight out of 31. Notice we're not doing any subtraction. This is a single trial. Either I get a freshman or I get in a single trial a sophomore. No subtraction. Now, here's what he says. Probability, probability of a freshman or a sophomore is the probability of a freshman added with the probability of a sophomore. There is no double count, all right? 23 over 31. A person cannot be a freshman and a sophomore at the same time. No, There's no worry about double counting or counting a person more than once. Notice that we simply add the probability of a freshman to the probability of a sophomore to find the probability that a student selected at random will either be a freshman or a sophomore. No student can be both at the same time. No double count. Like one student at random from a class, what's the probability the student is either a male or a sophomore? Well, there's eight sophomores out of 31. There's 14 males out of 31. But there are five sophomores who are also males. So I want to make sure that I don't double count those five people. All right. So we simply add the probability of a sophomore with the probability of a male. All right. But we're including sophomore males were included these five we've already got, we've added these guys twice I added it once to get the eight then i added the five again to get the number of males 
To compensate for this double summing, we simply subtract the probability that a person, hey, is a sophomore and a male at the same time. All right? So we're looking at the formal rule, probability of a sophomore added with the probability of a male minus the probability that a person was a sophomore and a male at the same time. We don't want to double count them. We counted them once as sophomores. We don't want to count them again as being males. You got one or the other. All right, so it would be 8 over 31 plus 14 over 31 minus the double count sophomores that were males over males that were sophomores. And 17 over 31 is a decimal, 0.548. So here's the formal definition. When things are mutually exclusive, when they can't happen, cannot happen at the same time, we simply have the probability of A occurring, added with the probability of B, and we're done. When... They are not mutually exclusive. When they could be a double count, we have to subtract that double count. Probably A and B occur at the same time. Laura is playing Monopoly. On the next move, she needs to uh, throw a sum bigger than eight on two dice in order to land on no property and pass go. What's the probability that Laura will roll a sum bigger than eight? When two dice are thrown, the largest sum that can come up is 12. Consequently, the only numbers that are bigger than 8 are 9, 10, 11, and 12. Well, I can't throw a 9 and throw a 10 at the same time. So these events are mutually exclusive. There's not going to be any double counts. These outcomes that I just said are mutually exclusive since only one of these sums can possibly occur on one throw of a die. Or throw of dice. Probability of throwing a 9. Um, plus the probability of a 10, plus the probability of 11, plus the probability of a 12. These are all numbers that she needs. These are all numbers bigger than 8. All right, probability that you roll a 9. Well, where's the 9? Right down here. We can get a 3 and a 6, a 4 and a 5, a 5 and a 4, or a 6 and a 3. There's four ways. How many ways can you roll a 10? A 6 and a 4, a 5 and a 5, or a... Sorry, a 4 and a 6, a 5 and a 5, or a 6 and a 4. Three ways. The 11, a 5 and a 6, or a 6 and a 5. There's two ways, and only one way of rolling a 12, a 6 and a 6. All right? These are all mutually exclusive. You can't roll a pair of dice and get a sum of 9 and 10 at the same time. It's either one or the other. Right, so it says 10 chances out of 36, 5 chances out of 8. All right, remember, this is a good thing to have. It tells you the ways you need to do totals. Make sure you have this in your notes. There are 36 degree-like outcomes. For the example, we found out the probability of how can you get a 9? You get a 6 and a 3, 6 on the first die, 3 on the second, or 3 on the first die, 6 on the second, and 5 and a 4, or 4 and a 5. So it's four ways. All right, many times, like I mentioned, you're given the, um, the information in a table, all right? What we're doing is taking a uh, polygraph test. You've seen this before. Um, positive result, all right? Two ways of getting a positive. You can get a false positive or a true positive. False positive means the machine said you lied and you didn't. True positive, you know, you lied and the machine caught you. A true negative, the machine said you didn't lie and you didn't lie. Or a false negative, it says you didn't lie, but you were lying through your teeth. Uh, number 17, if one of these test subjects is randomly selected, find a probability that the subject had a positive test result or did not lie. Well, here are my positive results. There's a total, I believe, of 98 people, right? I should have added these up. I got 57 that had a positive result. Did not lie. Well, it's this, these 15 people and these 32 people. This column represents did not lie. But you can see when I draw my circles, I'm about to double count these 15 people. Either I count them as positive results or I count them as did not lie. I don't want to count them twice. So I tell people that sometimes, you know, you count, you know, you get uh, 57 people here who did not uh, get a positive result. And when it comes time to count the probability of a negative result, just don't count those 15 people. Just say 32. Or if you want to add the 15 and the 32 to get 47, then you're going to subtract the 15. Some people find it easy, just don't double count right from the very inception. All right, here's a case where he's doing it the standard way. All right, there's 15 people where the 15, all right, are included in the positive and included in the 
uh, did not lie. I don't want to count these 15 people. I only want to count them once. I don't want to double count. Here's a case where I do it and I subtract it at the end. Or instead of using 40, 70, you could have used just 32. 57 and 32, 89. All right? Make that decision yourself. And I find it easy to draw circles around the columns and the rows. And then I'll see which one I'm about to double count. And I don't do it. Here, uh, find a probability if one of the subjects was randomly selected number 20. Find a probability that the subject had a negative test result or lied. Well, here are the 41 people who had a negative result. Here are the 51 people who lied. But notice these nine people had negative results and lied. I don't want to count them more than once. So I'm either going to add the 41 and the 51 and then subtract the nine, or maybe take the 41 instead of adding 51 for lied. Maybe don't count the nine, just add the 42. I'm either going to combine the nine and the 42 and subtract the nine later on, or just don't add the nine right from jump street. I mean, there it is. He does it the formal method. Right? Here, I would have maybe used 42 here and not have to worry about subtracting. I, on my own, didn't want to add the nine to those nine people who lied and then a positive uh, Not a positive result, but just lied. All right, here we have, and what I suggest, sometimes I give you, the problem gives you the totals. Here we're looking for, find a probability that selected, that the selected challenge was made by a man or was successful. Well, here are my men, and here are the people who had a successful challenge. All right, so here now, what first thing you need to do is get your totals. All right, so here are my males, 489 out of 839. But the problem didn't give me this. I had to add across, add across, and then add down, and add down on both of these. Notice this sum here, and this sum here. All right, so. Mail or had a successful challenge. Well, here are my mails here in red. It's 489 out of 839. Here are the 327 people that had a successful challenge. But notice, to get to 327, I had to add the 201. To get to 489, I had to add the 201. I don't want to count those 201s, these people that were male and were successful only once. I don't want to double count. So what he does here is he's at the very end here, he ends up subtracting 201. Or oh, here's an idea. Take 489 out of 839. Instead of making this 327, don't add the 201. Just include the 126. What it does is you take 327, subtract 201, gets what you get, 126. Some people find it easier not to double count right from Jump Street. And some people, you know, will add it and then end up subtracting it. Is up to you. All right, so here we are asked to find probability of a male or it was not successful. Well, here are my males, right? 201 and 288 for a total of 489 out of a total of 839. Was not successful. Well, not successful was these 288 and these 224 for a total of 512. But as you can see, I'm about to double count these 288. I counted them once. When I was counting up my males, and now I'm about to count them up again when I, I'm counting up people who were not successful. So if you want to do that, make sure you subtract the double count or just don't add it from Jump Street. Instead of saying 512, just use the 224. All right. Then you won't be then you won't, then you won't have to subtract the double count. Here again to get the idea. All right, hopefully this helps you out some. All right.